Roses have been an important part of our gardens for centuries. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Join me next as we take a closer look at some of these antique beauties. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. In today's show, we're going to get up close and personal with some fantastic old-fashioned roses. Now, if you love antiques, there's no reason why you shouldn't have some of these beauties in your garden. It's like having a bit of history growing in your backyard. We'll visit a man who has a passion for antique roses as we tour the Antique Rose Emporium. We'll also get tips on how to get the most blooms from your climbing roses. You won't believe how simple it is. And one of my favorite things to do with my roses is to mix them with other plants. The colorful combinations you can create will leave a lasting impression on all your garden guests. We'll also visit a community that's embracing its historical past through antique roses. And I want to share with you an easy, classic Italian recipe for making pesto. It's a great way to use all that basil from the garden. But first, let's travel to the Antique Rose Emporium and talk to a man who's become quite the expert on old-fashioned roses. We'll do that right after the break. An antique rose is generally defined as any rose that came on the scene before 1867. That's when the first hybrid tea was introduced. You know, those long stem roses that we buy at the florist. Now, a good example of this is this China rose, meaning that it originally came from China, called Old Blush. It was introduced before 1752, and it blooms all summer long. To me, the most amazing thing about Old Blush, it's one of the first roses that colonists planted in this country and it's still popular today because it's so tough and easy to grow. Now I like to regard these antique roses as just big shrubs that flower in the garden because they integrate so well with perennials and annuals and herbs. Many of these varieties go back as far as the 1500s and the reason we still have them today is because roses are so easily rooted from cuttings. Well, Alan, uh, taking cuttings is the most important way to ensure the heritage of these roses. This has been done for hundreds of years as these roses have been passed down. We have found taking a four inch cutting and leaving the top leaves intact and sticking these in the fall in a rose pot about this size is the best way to achieve this goal. Well, in the spring, we'll go inside the greenhouses and all the roses that we've been successful at rooting will come out into our fields and we'll pop them into these two gallon sized containers and with a little fertilizer and the will uh, to survive like these roses have, in a course of a year we've had full mature sized plants ready to be sold either through our mail order or through our retail or through our wholesale outlets. It's fascinating to me that archaeologists have found fossils of roses that go back three million years. And the first recorded reference of a rose growing in a garden was recorded by the ancient Sumerians over 3,000 years ago BC in what is now the country of Iraq. Here's a rose that Josephine, Napoleon's wife, would have known. She had a rose garden with 250 varieties. Of course, now there are thousands to choose from. We grow about 600 different varieties over, and I think we have probably 200,000 sitting out here in the field right now. We have 15 acres under production, and we're opening up two more acres for additional production. And we found these roses growing in, in the back roads of Texas and cemeteries and places like that. So this really struck a chord with me is, is how in the world can these roses grow without any care at all? So right, yeah. we decided to try to to take a few home via some cuttings and grow, grew them in our own nursery setting and they perform beautifully. And so what I learned was that these were truly garden plants, very, very different than what we know as modern roses today. That's the beauty behind old garden roses is that they, uh, they're very versatile, uh, not only from uh, the fact that they give you good fragrance and good color like our modern roses, but they also give you the ability to use so many different niches in the garden, whether it be a climber, a cascading shrub, a focal point in a whiskey barrel, or even a ground cover. So with that in mind, it's, it's just a, it just has opened up a new ballgame for me in terms of using roses in the landscape. A lot of times we get 
people that indicate that they can't control the rows, it's very important that we just simply train the rows around the structure that we've intended it to right. adorn. Whether it's an arbor or Whether a post it's a or tripod, a fence. whatever. And that's the whole key. Well, I see you've just sort of intertwined these, the almost more, braided them. The more you braid, the more uh, twisting and turning you do, the more production of roses that you get. So that's what's so nice about uh, uh, climbing roses. You need to harness them, don't let them harness you. Roses definitely don't have a problem making a statement in the garden on their own, but it's always nice to mix things up a bit. When we come back, I'll share with you some of my favorite plants that really know how to complement these gorgeous antiques. From spring preparation, summer watering, to fall cleanup, Fiskars delivers innovative ergonomic solutions that enrich the gardening experience. When I'm asked what is my favorite flower, it's always a difficult question for me to answer because there's so many beautiful ones out there to choose from. But I suppose that the rose comes about as close as any. But I like the rose the best when it's used in combination with other plants. Coming up with different combinations is a way to create a unique look for your garden, a way to put your own signature on it. Let's take a look at three categories of plants that are possibilities for using along with old-fashioned roses. We would probably all think of annuals first, like old-fashioned petunias or pansies, but I like using some of the less common varieties, such as baby blue eyes or pinta. Perennials are a natural with roses, and what's great about them is that they come back year after year. They hang around like the roses do, like this combination of daisies and this heritage rose. I've always found that gray foliage perennials, like lamb's ear and artemisia, are good complements to roses and very satisfying in a summer garden. We often overlook herbs as good companion plantings for roses, but they can flavor your rose garden just like they flavor your favorite meals. Take a look at this curly parsley border along this rose planting. Lavender is a classic in the rose garden, and a favorite of mine is rosemary. There's nothing quite like bringing together beauty and fragrance. It can add so much charm to the garden. Now speaking of charm, there's one town that embraces it to the fullest. Lovers of Civil War history and traditions of the Old South will find themselves transported back in time with a visit to Natchez, Mississippi. Here you can wander through centuries-old gardens of azaleas, camellias, and other old-fashioned flowers, and also tour magnificent antebellum homes. Visitors in search of beautiful flowers will find them here and in some of the most unlikely places. If you're a lover of roses, particularly the old-fashioned varieties, an old cemetery like this is a likely place to find them, as well as many other old-fashioned plants. This is the Natchez City Cemetery, positioned high on a bluff overlooking the mighty Mississippi River. Graves here date back as far as the late 1700s. The roses in the cemetery, uh, some of them are probably older than 80 years, maybe even 100 years old, and they've survived without any care for all that time. So. Terry Tillman is an antique rose enthusiast and has taken an interest in preserving these roses and introducing varieties that would have been found here before the Civil War and after. Well, after the Heritage Rose Foundation met here in 1993, they began a mapping survey. I finished the mapping survey, and then a group of women in the Garden Club formed a cemetery rose preservation committee, and we've divided the cemetery up into manageable sizes, and two to three women take over an entire plat, so to speak and they're responsible for pruning and mulching those roses on a twice a year, perhaps. This is real dirt gardening work when you take on a cemetery project, but it's, once you divide it up, it's very easy to manage, and it's something that anybody can do in his or her community. And what a tribute to that community. Natchez, perhaps more than any other southern town, has worked very hard to preserve its historical identity, but so far those efforts have focused on the architecture, man-made structures, but I'd like in the future to see those efforts expand and include our horticultural heritage because I think landscape preservation is just as important as preserving man-made structures. Absolutely. Terry, what have you found to be the greatest threat to these old-fashioned roses in the Natchez Cemetery? Well, here in the Natchez City Cemetery, at least in the six years that I've been out here working, um, the greatest threat has been man and his machines. Um, we've lost so many wonderful roses in that time, despite our best efforts. In fact, there was a beautiful white noisette growing right here at the end of this hill, and it was so unusual, we were certain that it was to be found nowhere else in the country, and uh, despite my best efforts, it was um, 
cut down by a weed eater, and I was really distressed because I'd never been able to propagate it. And there's the culprit. Yes, there weed it is. Weed eater line I found here the, on the ground. Exactly. Yep. But one day when I was um, walking through my own garden at home, I noticed a white noisette I didn't realize I had. And when I examined slides of the cemetery noisette and looked at the one in my own garden, I realized that I had saved it after all. Oh, that's great. So it's now in propagation. We hope to return it to the cemetery. By Nothing the fall. better than a story with a happy ending. You know, Alan, you can probably find more antique roses in the Natchez City Cemetery today than you can anywhere else in town. But this wasn't always the case. Um, a traveler came through here in 1857 and wrote an article for a well-known journal, The Horticulturist, and he said that Natchez was the Persia of roses. In no other state of the Union, he wrote, have they ever attained such beauty and perfection. What a wonderful quote. Well, I'd like to see Natchez be worthy of that term again. I'd like to have visitors come and call it the Persia of roses. So we're going to keep working at the cemetery and try to maintain these beautiful roses. With antique roses in every garden. Absolutely. Coming up, we'll mix and match some spectacular colors and learn about one of my favorite plants. That's next, so stay with us. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. In today's show, we're taking a look at the role of antique roses in the garden. Now, you know, I'm always trying to experiment with roses and coming up with new ways to use them. Just take a look at this climbing rose that I've grown on this trellis. Now, you wouldn't think of growing a climbing rose in a container, but it's actually worked out rather well. I used a variety called White Dawn. It's a vigorous grower and very disease resistant. Now, I started with a large container, large terracotta pot like this, about 24 inches in diameter. And I created this trellis, which is just a one-dimensional trellis for the plant to grow on. Now, throughout the growing season, I just weave the canes up through the trellis. Now, if you'll notice, on the finished trellis, I stained it a dark walnut color. So the foliage and blooms would really stand out. You know, the amazing thing about this is that I started with a three gallon size rose back in the early spring, and in just one growing season, it's grown all the way to the top and bloomed profusely. Now, I underplanted it with variegated Cuban oregano and that wonderful little apple blossom petunia. Just goes to show you, you don't have to have a garden to be able to enjoy climbing roses. You can grow them in a container on your patio or terrace. You know, I really enjoy experimenting, trying new ideas and combinations of plants. It's one of the greatest joys of gardening. But I have to say, it's always comforting to fall back on an old standby, such as coleus. One variety in particular is stunning for mixing in beds and containers. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, now, isn't coleus a shade plant? Well, this series by the flower fields is expressly for sun. In fact, the more sun, the deeper and richer the colors. I recently had an opportunity to speak with Ralph Rep, a coleus breeder, about the stained glasswork series during a marketplace for new plant introductions. Ralph, you must be excited to see a lot of your coleus here at the marketplace. Well, this is very exciting for us because uh, we've worked on it for quite a few years and we've had to overcome the fact that coleus have always been a uh, sort of a shade plant. My mother grew them for years in the shade and so forth and now we have a full sun line that allows us to put these plants out and very strong conditions. Well, I have to say, I have grown your coleus like this wonderful molten lava for the last couple of years, and it's spectacular. This is uh, this was my first first one that we bred. Really? Yeah, this was our first one. Well, you uh, knocked the ball out of the park with molten lava. Once in a while, you hit a home run. <laughs> it is truly spectacular. Yeah. Now, what can we expect in the future from your coleus breeding program? Well, we're looking for more of the spreading hanging basket types and then we're trying to react to specific requests for color. Well, some of my favorites out of your line have been the trailing coleus that will spill out of containers. Right. Like trailing plum and trailing rose. Yeah. Trailing plum was uh, is another, I think it's going to be a home run for us that uh, uh, once the public gets to use that, they're going to love it. The thing that I enjoy the most about the coleus is that you've got such a wide range of, of color that you can work it into so many different flowers. Yes. yes. Well, Ralph, I'm looking forward to seeing some of these new varieties you'll be coming up with. Well, and we're looking forward to getting them out to you. If you plan to grow coleus from the stained glass work series in your garden, keep in mind that the plants are vigorous growers and respond best to humus-rich soil. You should water them just enough to keep the soil consistently moist and feed them every two weeks or so during the active growing season. 
I just use an all-purpose balanced fertilizer. In order to get the fullest, most robust plants, I encourage pinching back the tips of the stems throughout the summer. You know, I also remove all of the blooms from the coleus. After all, the reason I'm growing that plant is for its gorgeous foliage. Now that we've worked up an appetite, let's shift into the kitchen. Up next, I'll share my recipe for an easy to prepare Italian dish made from fresh basil. That's after the break, so don't go away. Welcome back. When it comes to most Italian dishes, herbs play such an important role. One of the herbs I always find plenty of room for in my garden is basil. Just when I think I have enough, I always add a few more plants because basil is the key ingredient in one of my favorite dishes, pesto. You know, pesto is a classic Italian sauce that's served over pasta. It actually comes from a place in Italy called Genoa. Now, I know that may seem like a long way from here, but it has American connections. Christopher Columbus was from there. Now, I know this sounds like a fancy gourmet dish, but it's actually very easy to make. Start by rinsing and draining some fresh basil. You'll need enough for one tightly packed cup of chopped leaves. Next, pour the leaves into a blender and add two cloves of fresh garlic, a quarter of a teaspoon of ground pepper, and a fourth a cup of olive oil. The next ingredient is pine nuts, or you can use walnuts. I like to toast them in the oven. It gives them a little different flavor, but if you do, don't let them stay in too long. You can burn them. Add half a cup of the nuts to the blender and puree all the ingredients together. The last step is to stir in about a cup of Romano or Parmesan cheese. You can add a little salt at this point if you like, but I usually like to wait until I've folded it into one of my favorite pastas. This recipe makes a little over a cup, and when you use it, you want to use about a half a cup per pound of fresh cooked pasta. With basil being so plentiful this time of year, make some extra pesto. It's ideal for freezing and using in the fall and winter. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I hope you've been inspired to try roses, whether you plant them directly in your garden or in containers. Now, any of the information you've seen in today's show can be found on my website. That's pallensmith.com. That also includes that tasty pesto recipe. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile But smile